You're listening to DK Mag Horror Entertainment News Podcast Online source for news Interviews and trending topics Good afternoon Good evening Good morning This is Ken R2's DK Mag Founder You're listening to DK Mag Horror Entertainment News Podcast Season 9 Episode 10. After a brief hiatus, we return with our podcast platforms, and in this episode, we have exclusive interview with filmmaker Conrad Farage. We'll be discussing his upcoming, well, his newly released project titled Fighting the Sky. We also have interviews with Adam Rotness and Stuart Stone writers for the newly released horror film Scarecrow the film to which Stuart Stone serves in the directorial capacity in addition to our exclusive interviews we have news on upcoming horror films horror in television and of course our trailer first impressions Also, please do stop by dkmag.com. We debuted on March 12th, our digital issue. And this issue is a full-fledged hard copy, quote-unquote, magazine, but specially designed for your mobile device, be it an iPhone and or Android. No additional app to download. Simply visit DK Mag. Subscribe for the whole year, which right now until April 1st, we have a special $15 for the whole year of our quarterly, yearly uh, subscription. After April 1st, it's going to be $20. And each issue is $5 $5 and we have contributing writers we have exclusive content on our digital edition issue once again we debuted on March 12th this year quote unquote a portable magazine for your mobile device so we have entered the world of publishing so please do show your support by purchasing an issue or reserving your yearly subscription without further ado let's begin we have a lot of topics to cover dk mag horror entertainment news podcast season 9 episode 10 segment one movie news Back in January of this year, 2019, Deadline report that actor, director, writer John Krasinski will return in the director's chair for the sequel to The Sleeper Psychological Horror Thriller, A Quiet Place. Krasinski, notable for his role in The Office and his latest project, Tom Clancy's Jack Ryan will also pen the script for A Quiet Place 2. A Quiet Place really made an impact in the horror community. $17 million, that was the budget production, and it went on to earn worldwide $340 million and domestic sales added to $188 million. Actress Emily Blunt is rumored to also be featured and reprise her role in the sequel. So far, the film is in pre-production. What that means is the cast is getting developed, the script is getting developed, and all the intricacies of the film is getting developed. But according to Deadline in their article, John Krasinski hinted on a release date via his Instagram profile and of course, We could take this as a grain of salt because social media platforms is not a source 
four, verified news. Krasinski wrote May 15, 2020 as the release date for A Quiet Place 2. The synopsis to A Quiet Place is as follows in a post-apocalyptic world. A family is forced to live in silence while hiding from monsters with ultra-sensitive hearing. John Krasinski portrayed the role of Lee Abbott with opposite Emily Blunt in the role of Evelyn Abbott. Child actress Millicent Simmons portrayed the role of Reagan Abbott. So far, according to INDB, there is no plot whatsoever for the sequel to A Quiet Place, but we have the producers Brad Fuller and Andrew Form will be releasing a, the sequel to A Quiet Place through their newly launched production company, Fully Formed Entertainment, which recently tied a three-year exclusive first look deal at Paramount Pictures. Andrew Form and Brad Fuller have been churning out horror content for quite a while now, including the Purge series and also the Purge TV series. Andrew Form and Brad Fuller have been working together under the Platinum Dunes banner and with their new production company, they will be churning out new content in the sci-fi and horror realm and of course action since the production company is behind Jack Ryan, Tom Clancy's Jack Ryan that is. No word, solidified word on the rest of the cast for a Quiet Place sequel. No plot details. All we can go for right now is that John Krasinski is returning to direct and to write the, the screenplay for the sequel. And perhaps Emily Blunt will join the cast. Let's see, as I had mentioned earlier, uh, Quiet Place was really a sleeper hit and it was one of the handful of psychological thrillers, horror films that have released recently. Another contender in that genre is Hereditary, a sleeper hit and wow, fantastic films in itself and it's really expanding on the creativity and originality in horror cinema usually we get the reboots and remakes from hollywood and it is a refreshing take to see both a quiet place and hereditary taking the spotlight as uh, we can call it low budget but hey uh 17 million dollars is not so low budget in for an indie film big production rigged racked in huge rewards there's an audience that are thirsty for new horror content and I think both Hereditary and A Quiet Place fills that void. Can't wait to see this sequel. And for those who haven't seen A Quiet Place, do check it out and digest the content. Remember, it's not a full-fledged horror film. It's more of a slow burner, psychological thriller with creatures and human nature and survival. Warner Brothers reschedules horror content and Space Jam sequel. As we are all well aware, Godzilla King of Monsters will release this year 2019, and this film is the build-up for Godzilla vs. Kong, which back in February it was announced that production has begun. Kong vs. Godzilla, Godzilla vs. Kong, as well as Godzilla King of Monsters are directed by Adam Wingard. Godzilla vs. Kong will have a all-star cast that includes Millie Bobby Brown, Alexander Skarsgård, Rebecca Hall, Brian Tyree Henry, Eliza Gonzalez, Jessica Henwick, and Kyle Chandler to name a few. The synopsis for Godzilla vs. Kong, Kong vs. Godzilla 
whichever you prefer, whichever team you are on, is as follows. In a time when monsters walk the earth, humanity's fight for its future sets Godzilla and Kong on a collision course that would see the two most powerful forces of nature on the planet collide in a spectacular battle for the ages as Monarch embarks on a perilous mission into uncharted terrain and unearths clues to the titan's origin a human conspiracy threatens to wipe the creatures both good and bad from the face of the earth in addition to the production announcement for Godzilla vs. Kong, Warner Brothers have announced a rescheduling of their upcoming horror titles and the sequel to Space Jam. And here are the rescheduled releases. Space Jam, of course, for those who are familiar with the original that starred Michael Jordan and the animated cast from Warner Brothers, will release on the 16th of July, 2021. Godzilla vs. Kong will release March 13, 2020. The next installment for the Conjuring franchise Annabelle will release in the last weekend in June. Godzilla vs. Kong had the original release date for May 29th, 2020 and it was moved. Now the date is March 13, 2020. We have 2020, the year 2020 filled with a lot of horror content. We have Annabelle, we have Godzilla vs. Kong. We also have Marvel in the mix, which is off topic here, but they will be releasing Gambit. Spider-Man Far From Home will also release next year. Incredible lineup from Warner Brothers with their horror content. Another con, the only thing I have to uh, weigh opinion on is the next installment of Annabelle. Uh, the first film did improve well with the horror community or audiences in general. The sequel, on the other hand, proved to fare well with the audience reception wise. Let's see how this third installment of Annabelle, let's see how it would be. I'm looking forward to Godzilla vs. Kong. I'm also looking forward to Godzilla, King of Monsters. Uh, these were the films that I would watch, uh, let's say, on Saturday mornings after the animated uh, cartoons run down between 7 a.m. to, let's say, 11 a.m. There would be martial arts films and Godzilla films. And that's, that is so nostalgic. And I think this is really tailoring for the millennial demographic. We have this resurgence of a flashback. G.I. Joe, Transformers, Godzilla takes us to an era where things were simplistic in the plot. The characters are well constructed and we could definitely root for either or King Kong or Godzilla. I guess we have to wait for next year, but the buildup begins this year with Godzilla King of Monsters. Peter Weller will not reprise role for RoboCop Returns. Have you seen the latest KFC commercials? It features RoboCop. Yes, RoboCop is the new spokesperson slash enforcer for the new slate of commercials for KFC. And it's portrayed by Peter Weller, who also portrayed this role in the 1987 release. And of course, the sequel that released three years later. So does this mean that Peter Weller will also be in Neil Bloomkamp's sequel? Yes, there is a sequel. And the answer to that question is no. 
the 71-year-old actor Peter Weller says he is not interested in reprising his role as Alex Murphy slash Robocop for Neil Blomkamp's sequel, which so far is titled Robocop Returns. Discussions are in the early stages. This is pre-pre-production for this sequel, which of course it is supposed to start fresh. Such was the case with John Carpenter's Halloween, which was an immediate sequel to the first film and it erases completely every other film adaptation of Halloween that were released in the franchise. Neil Blomkamp is starting fresh in this franchise. This sequel that he is creating starts off one year after the events of the first film. Although Neil Blomkamp wanted actor Peter Weller to portray the role of Alex Murphy slash Robocop in his Twitter, it seems like the actor is not interested in the role. The sequel for Robocop is penned by Justin Rhodes. Rhodes also serves as the writer for the upcoming Terminator reboot. The original screenwriter for Robocop, Ed Neumeyer, is producing the film with Michael Miner set as executive producer. So the powerhouse team, the production team behind this sequel, immediate sequel for Robocop is already solidified. The cast, however, is not solidified. And the only hint for the plot is, as I have mentioned, the film sets itself one year after the events of part one. Here is the highlight, and for me in particular, I am a huge advocate for R-rated films. I like action-packed uh, violence, but of course it has to be artistic. Robocop, when it released in 1987, had a hard R rating, and you could also check out, if it's still available, the unrated version of Robocop on Amazon Prime, which includes unseen footage. This new sequel of Robocop Returns will have an R rating, and this Neil Bloom Camp states as well. Hopefully, it stays that way. As we have seen with Venom, the rumor mill was blowing with an R rating for that film and it eventually got a PG-13 rating and of course for its Blu-ray DVD release, it continued to have a PG-13 rating. We want an R rated Robocop film, action, intense action, some gore, some political commentary such as the original 1987 release. If you're unfamiliar with Neil Boomkamp's work, he has a YouTube channel that is rich science fiction character driven narratives. He is also the director from Elysium District 9 Chappie. Uh, the guy knows how to craft his films, blending eye candy, CGI, and of course, well written scripts. And Robocop deserves a well-written presentation. The 2014 release reboot did not fail well with fans of the franchise. Neither did the following sequels from the 1987 release or neither did the TV series. It was short-lived. If any franchise should be reinvigorated, it should be Robocop. Exclusive interview. Conrad Farage, writer, director, Fighting the Sky. There's been a lot of buzz over the last few weeks about strange sounds being heard in the atmosphere. People around the world and here at home have reported hearing some bizarre noises. Do you think this might the be latest real? were recorded in the bowel. We're all here. 
hearing the sounds. They're coming from all over the place, all over the world. But what are they? And we ask ourselves that with no possibility of a good answer or a definite answer. The governments of the world don't know what the hell is going on. To kick off our interview, please do provide an origin story, a little bit about yourself and how you got your start in creating film, writing for film, and a little bit on your latest release, Fighting the Sky. I was always very passionate about film from a very, very young age. I kind of became obsessed with them when I was 12 years old. I was a big uh, fan of the Harry Potter films, and I started writing fan fiction, Harry Potter fan fiction. And then I decided to take it a step further. I said, wouldn't it be nice if someone made my Harry Potter fan fiction into films? And so I decided to do it myself. And I started to do these Harry Potter shorts. And, and then it kind of just, I caught the, the film bug, so to speak. After I had done those, I just started making films out of anything. Even in high school, I was making films for, for projects and things. And then it just kind of sort of became my job. And I've been doing it for over 15 years. And um, now I have just finished uh, my biggest project to date, which is a film titled Fighting the Sky. And uh, it's a film that we've been working on for three years. It's a science fiction um, alien invasion film. And uh, yeah, it's uh, about a group of ufologists who um, follow these kind of emerging atomic or um, apocalyptic sounds in the sky. And it ends up being turning into this giant alien invasion. So this, this is where we are now. Uh, reading over your INDB, it states also you were born in San Pedro, Honduras. That's right. Yes. I, uh, yeah, I was born in San Pedro. Um, I moved to the United States when I was uh, 11 and a half years old. We always emphasize also on the the Latino community as well, oh. and especially the ideas, fresh ideas coming from the Latino community. And I'm fascinated now that we see a, a rise and surgence of new directors, filmmakers, ideas. Yeah, no, I completely agree with that, honestly. And, you know, there's not that many, like, Honduran filmmakers out there either, which is really interesting. I mean, I knew, I know a couple of them, I know a few of them, but there's really not that many. So I'm really proud to be a part of that very small niche of Honduran filmmakers that, you know, you know have come to the United States and are making films in the United States. We have uh, interviewed a, a while back uh, uh, filmmakers from Chile, and I, I'm assuming that... It, it also has the same context in Honduras, which is the money factor. There's hungry filmmakers out there, but may not have the monetary resources as we do here in the United States. Well, even let's say crowdfunding where a project could be made, uh, let's say even a 10 minute short film would cost a pretty, pretty hefty budget in, in South and Central America. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the amount of resources that we have here is luxurious compared comparatively to, you know, those other countries. Um, and, and my goal personally is to someday go back to Honduras to direct something substantial, to, to have my skills honed here in the United States and to bring my resources that I've, that I've acquired here in the United States and go over there and, and shoot something, something of quality. Um, but yes, they, you know, their, right. their resources are lacking, definitely. I have to give a huge applause to Netflix. Uh, recently, they've been sh showcasing Latinos, and especially from horror in the horror sector, they have Diableros, and soon they're going to have uh, Siempre Bruja. Yeah. I'm like, wow, <laughs> finally, we, we get some recognition here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Major props to them, major props. That's, that's a good thing. Jumping on to your latest project of Fighting the Sky really caught my attention right away because there, to my knowledge, I may be wrong, but to my knowledge, there's only two films, your film being the second one that delves into the topic of quote unquote sky quakes. And that is a phenomenon that's been happening across the globe for, I would say, over the past five years. Yes. No, absolutely. No, definitely. You know, that, that would have been a good title, Skyquakes. That's, that's good. Um, but you, yeah, you know, <laughs> um, and that's kind of what attracted me to doing the project because I knew that I always wanted to do an alien invasion film. Since I was young, I knew that I wanted to do one. Uh, but I never had this kind of, I'd never had a hook. That, you know, I never had a, a story. So then when I started, you know, mm -hmm. um, hearing about these, as you call them, sound quakes, um, I, you know, I became fascinated. I said, wow, there's a movie right there. That's a movie. 
Uh, so then I started developing it and I started doing more research. And then ultimately, that's what became Fighting the Sky. That is what I say, uh, thinking outside the box here, because there are so many untapped areas in hor horror and science fiction. And as I mentioned, this film being the second one that I see that tap into this topic uh, is, is quite fascinating for those who haven't heard about it. it, it these are quite frightening. And it's even happening here uh, more so with the end of 2018, the beginning of 2019. And even scientists have no clue whatsoever on what these sounds are coming from. Yes, exactly. And that's something that we we talk about in the film as well. We talk about scientists having no clue. There's really no point of origin. It's just kind of this unknown entity, this mysterious entity in the skies that we don't really know about. And it's fascinating to people. I mean, it's fascinating to me. For, for me, I've been in, fascinated with the whole topic of UFOs research and of course, uh, extraterrestrial. Uh, f were you coming across this topic as from a skeptic point of view or uh, really intrigued with the whole notion of perhaps extraterrestrials or UFOs may have some sort of significance? No, I have, I have never been a skeptic. Uh, I've always believed, and, and, you know, and I think everyone to some degree or another has their own like maybe UFO story or, you know, or what have you. Um, and I do as well. In fact, when I was very young, uh, when I had just moved to, to the United States, I honestly thought that I had seen a UFO. Like I was getting ready for bed and I was, I was getting ready. And I, I thought I heard something outside in the backyard and I, and I, and I opened the window and I swear to God, I saw something just fly up from my backyard into the air. I saw this kind of green light and I couldn't tell what it was, but I just saw this green light. And I put that scene into the movie, into Fighting the Sky. And I, I have always believed that the universe is, is too big of, you know, for it to just be human beings on planet Earth. Um, so I do think that there's life out there. Um, you know, and, and it's one of those things that it's, you know, and I, and I hope that someday, that, you know, I live long enough to, to see that happen, to see us make contact uh, with other beings, because I'm definitely a true believer. I, I say the same thing too myself with my wife. I say I hope <laughs> something significant happens before we we pass away because yeah. it's it's quite fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. And I, absolutely. Like as I mentioned, I do enjoy the topic of UFOs and extraterrestrials, but I always have that skeptic in me. It's always that part. Like I don't believe it until I yeah. see it. And the last the last uh, couple of years back, we had the uh, the solar eclipse. Yeah. So here I am, I take, I take my DSLR, I hook it up, I point it to, not directly at the sun, of course, that damages the right. lens, but off, off away from yeah. the sun, start recording, yeah, put it into my uh, video editing program, I'm like, holy shit, yeah. wow, I just, I've recorded UFOs. Oh my goodness. I'm like, well, okay, there's my evidence. Oh my gosh, <laughs> yeah, oh my gosh, yeah, wow, <laughs> that's amazing, you know, yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> and, you know, it's funny, though, since I had started doing this movie, Fight in the Sky, people have, have come to me and said, I have a UFO story, or I have this, and I didn't realize just how many people have these stories. Mm -hmm. you know? But I think they're just too, too shy to say them out loud or, or too shy to you know, share them with people. Uh, but it, it's crazy right. how many of us really have these stories, you know? Right. And... The, the the power right now is in everyone's hands uh, not so much a few years ago let's say even 10 years ago we didn't have this power and it all comes down to mobile devices the cameras the, the video recording capabilities everyone has them so it's readily accessible you see something weird even if it's a crime or whatever yeah. boom everyone whips out the camera and yeah can record it for evidence. Yeah, no, definitely. And then, you know, that's something that I also incorporated into the film was technology. I wanted, I wanted the, the movie to have a lot of technology. You know, I wanted people to communicate mm -hmm. through FaceTime, uh, you know, or, or, you know, or, or, or take, or taking their phones to record sounds. Like I wanted to implement how advanced our technology has, has come in today's day and age. Yeah. If we jump on YouTube and, and any right, reputable ufo research channel that's the first thing that we would see regular average people recording these weird sounds in the sky which is as i mentioned sounds weird sounds like the the trumpets you, that we read in in in, in sunday school the uh, i forget what it was the the apocalyptic 
trumpets or what have you. But it's frightening in a way that it's happening worldwide. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's kind of terrifying, but it's also kind of interesting, you know, how we can kind of keep track of that. You know, we can keep track of, how, you know, what parts of the world this happened to. You know, and I, and I, when I was doing research for Fighting the Sky, I, have, I found the strangest, most bizarre videos. Um, you know, and it's interesting because if I wasn't, you know, I wasn't a skeptic at all when doing this movie, but these videos were just were even further proof. You know, it's like, who could make this thing up? No one can make this up, you know? These videos are factual evidence that there, you know, are things happening out there in the universe that we don't know about. You present a very interesting perspective in in the film. Uh, not only do you uh, provide the 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 experience of the uh, the skyquakes, yeah. the people who are affected by them, they are listening, but you also provide. The UFO researchers, which of course they have, they themselves have the comedic element to yeah. the film, but it's, it's these different angles that you provide that really, when a viewer watches the film, they oh okay, I have the perspective of the reporter, I have the perspective of the researchers. Uh, was that initially in the script to provide all these different points of view from all these characters? I definitely wanted to have a broad point of view when it came to this subject matter. Um, and what's interesting about the script is that it was always constantly changing. And, you know, there really was never a script. Uh, that's a bit of trivia. There was mm -hmm. actually, it was all improv. The entire movie was improvised. There was no screenplay. Uh, but what, what there was was a very Ooh. solid treatment. It was like a 12 to 13 okay. page treatment. And it kept changing. And I definitely wanted different points of view. Because, you know, when I watched, you know, UFO, you know, UFO movies or, or, or movies about a great adventures, I definitely wanted to have that kind of reporter aspect but I wanted to have that research aspect. I wanted to have every kind of aspect that could be covered in a movie about, you know, going out and adventuring and finding something and seeking something. All of the actors didn't have a structured line that they, they had to memorize. It was all there improv. There was only one scene that was physically written as a screenplay. Uh, and that was it. Everything else they came up with themselves. I, there was not a single word written. Wow. That is experimental filmmaking right there. Uh, <laughs> curiosity how many take did you have to do for one scene in particular since everything was improv honestly just as many as we would on a normal you know structured screenplay film uh what what really helped though was rehearsing because we would rehearse and we would rehearse and we would rehearse until it finally sounded natural until it sounded a little organic until they became familiar with each other because the actors met Basically, the night before, the night before filming, they had just met all the prime actors. And I had people coming from L.A., I had people from, from different states. And, um, and I wanted them to feel like they had known each other for a very long time. So we did some really intense rehearsing. Before, you know, while my camera crew was lighting and, you know, and setting up, I would rehearse with the actors and I would talk to them about their characters. And we would go over what I wanted them to say and to express. I mean, and they had the treatment, so they knew the story. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it honestly was a very smooth shoot. I really trusted their instincts, uh, when it came to, you know, saying their dialogue, I guess the only tricky part was in the edit because there's a little nuance, there's a little lines that could be different. So editing is a little bit more challenging. It's almost like editing a documentary, uh, doing this kind of film. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think, you know, um, we did what we did and, and I'm proud of, of, you know, what we achieved. Wow, that I think this is the first time I've actually heard uh, such an experimental uh, way of of creating a feature film. I, I would see that as a short film, but that's kind of risky for a feature, and it worked out great <laughs> because all the, all the on screen chemistry. That's what I look for with the dialogue and the monologue is if the if the actor the actress can convey that on screen chemistry, and, and that was evident especially in one scene in particular where the researchers were fleeing for their lives in the open field. I felt that was authentic in itself right there. Yeah, and that, <laughs> there was no script. So, <laughs> we, uh, yeah, it was experimental filmmaking at its highest level that I've done. Um, you know, and it's good because I had such, you know, I had so many, you know, big cameras and we had camera trucks and this big lighting set up. And, you know, at the end of the day, we didn't have that script to fall back on. It was instinct. It was this very tiny treatment, this story. You had mentioned that Fighting the Sky, one of your biggest uh, uh, projects. Uh, what was it about the project that made it so grand? Was it from the budget uh, going in the investors or was it the overall experience of creating 
uh, something enriched in, in science fiction? Honestly, it was it was a combination of all of that. I mean, definitely the budget. It, it was by far the biggest I've been trusted with so far. Um, but also, as far as the ambition, I wanted to be more ambitious with this, uh, you know, as opposed to anything that I've ever done before. Like, I wanted to really push myself. And I wanted to say, can I really do this? Can I really have these massive, like, UFOs flying across the town and, you know, burning things up? Can I do that? Is that something, you know, that I can take on? Um, so to me, it felt like it was I was undertaking this, this huge thing. Uh, I, I almost felt like I was, you know, in a way fighting... Uh, a battle with with the film, you know, trying to to win, trying to really accomplish this, trying to finish this, trying to get all the effects in, trying to, you know, get my dolly shots in and my, you know, my, you know, big elaborate shots on a very minuscule, tiny budget and make it look as big as I possibly could. For up and coming filmmakers, one of the things that uh, we we always note in our interviews or discussions on the podcast is when they're creating a, a screenplay. They should avoid all the spaceships and aliens and just go bare bones and create something that they have within their budget resources. And, and seeing and hearing that the way that you have filmed this, no script, only a treatment, uh, you went totally the opposite. <laughs> well, you know what? Sometimes you have to take risks, you know, whether they pay out or not. That's, you know, that's entirely different. But sometimes you just have to take risks as, as filmmakers because I feel like that's what keeps us motivated. That's what keeps us inspired. Uh, and this, uh, yeah, I mean, it was a big risk to, to do it the way that I did it. And, you know, like the first image that came to my head when I was, you know, and, and mm -hmm. like I said, I agree with you, most filmmakers, and even I honestly do that too. I think, how do I, you know, how do I work with my budget? How do I do this? Uh, but, but the one image that stuck to my head, the moment I came up with the film was this alien spaceship attacking this small town and characters running, mm -hmm. scrambling through this like city, this is a very <laughs> small city. And I just uh -huh. thought that was such a cool thing. Uh, and I wanted it to be very, like, very 50s vibe. Like, I wanted to have, like, the 50s, like, almost like a B-movie modern day with modern spaceships. Like, how cool would that be, I thought. Um, so <clears throat> I knew right. from the start that I needed to have a scene like that. I, I knew from the start that I needed to have total destruction. Um, and, yeah, that, that's how kind of, kind of I, I basically structured my treatment was, okay, how do I get to this point? And after this this point, how can the characters move forward? It's funny that you mentioned it. I did catch that 50s vibe and uh, invasion from Mars when, when these uh, spaceships started to do their thing. Uh, that was, mind you, I for CGI, that's one area that I'm uh, you know, not too keen with. But I have to admit, I did like the the texture of the spacecrafts themselves. I say, hmm... This is, if we want to see a UFO, I think that's the type of st structure they would have as opposed to these shiny disks that are commonly reported throughout the world. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Thank you for pointing that out. You know, not that many people point that out. That's one of the things I literally had days and days of discussions as to what I wanted the texture of the spaceship to, to be like. Like, I remember being in LA, like talking to my designers and saying, like, I want them to be like these very grungy almost like almost tribal in a way like the way that the, that the, the the ship feels i don't want it to be metallic i don't want it to be you know shiny i want it to feel like it's this thing that's been flying for years and years and years you know almost like uh, you know a little aged in a way so with this project now complete is in distribution uh what are, were some of the learning points in in creating a film of this caliber i learned a lot um i mean i i honestly don't know if i would do another uh, improv movie because of how exhausted it made me uh, <laughs> you know and, and, and sometimes uh -huh. i felt like i didn't like it, it was going out of control sometimes i was like oh my gosh i've shot too much footage or i have mm -hmm. too much of this or you know um, so I think I need to, I've, I've learned to pace myself a little better. Um, you know, I've learned to make more direct decisions, uh, when it comes to, to my directing at least. Um, and yeah, I mean, I just, you know, it, it's all about time management as well. I feel like I learned mm -hmm. a lot about time management, a little, I learned a lot about handling, uh, an insane amount of people. I feel like, you know, I know where my faults were. I know, um, you know how you know how people are after a certain amount of hours i just feel like i learned a lot of just overall about directing directing people the responsibility of the director 
for those who are starting out is you're being a captain of the ship and in most cases you may find a weakness in some areas and that's why you would need a producer or an assistant just to handle all the questions while you're taking care of all the te technical <laughs> yes. aspects. Yes, absolutely. And that's, yeah, I was wearing so many hats on this film, even on set. I mean, I had a lot of producers uh, on the film who were mostly financiers, you know, from different areas and stuff. Right. But I didn't really have an on-set producer that, much i really mm -hmm. didn't so it was just me i had i, I had assistant directors i definitely had help you know i didn't do this by myself but i i definitely could have used another you know set of eyes and ears to, to tell people hey you know don't do this or do it like that or you know to handle different aspects of the production because i did feel a little overwhelmed sometimes uh taking this on right and that's that's the whole thing with indie filmmaking is you're not just the producer, you're not just the director, you have to wear so many hats, especially after the filming, and it's on the editing floor. Uh, yeah, You have to be the co-editor as well. It has to be in your DNA. You have to really be passionate about making films and, and see it all the way to the end, because yes, on our level, it's you know you will be taking on so many different jobs. Uh, jobs that you didn't even know you were, you know, you had to do. Like, for example, like, you know, for this one, I had to help with the sound mix and the coloring and I edited the movie. Um, so it was just a lot of, a lot of things. As a writer, I, I often hear, and I agree with this, with this uh, notion that the basis of the film starts with the script. And of course, the script in itself is a living entity and it would change over time. So looking back on Fighting the Sky, would you have would have structured the script uh, the, the regular way of approaching it? Or would you have just winged it have you did right now? Well, I wouldn't say we winged it because there was a lot of planning. Um, you know, we, there was definitely imp improv. It was like controlled improvisation is what I would like to call it, honestly. Um, but I honestly, but you know, it's funny because I would, I would now, you know, you know, like three years later, I would do a balance of both. I would have actually written a script, but I would have actually let my actors improvise a lot of it. I would have said, okay, this is going to be, you know, the way that it's supposed to be structured wise, but you guys can give me some improvise. I want it to be organic. I want it to sound natural. So it would honestly be like a nice balance of both. Uh, once you give a 90 page script to uh, to an actor to any member of the cast that is going to be in the film that 90 page script will come back to you uh, with 20 extra pages with notes and yeah. this and that that the actor had to write in they ask you questions uh, how is his demeanor how is she acting what is she feeling oh, absolutely. <laughs> that all comes with the, the oh, script absolutely, yeah <laughs> absolutely uh, but you know I encourage, I encourage that stuff I encourage it but you know it, it was kind of fun too to kind of like on the day, kind of learn, you know, you know how we were going to approach uh, a, a particular scene, and and you know, and I, I'm not the first filmmaker to do that. There's other films that have done kind of improv, kind mm -hmm. of you know, material. Um, like one of my favorite films of all time, like Crazy by Drake Doremus, won Sundance in 2011. You know, that was the film that kind of inspired it. Uh, and then even before then, mm -hmm. uh, Breathless, uh, Jean Luc Godard's Breathless was mostly improvised. Um, and I was thinking, okay, if you guys could do it, you know, I definitely should give it a shot. Uh, except I did it on this like crazy scale with spaceships and, and, and attacks and all this <laughs> stuff. So it was completely different than doing like a drama or like a nice little comedy. So fighting the sky it does provide the the action, the sci-fi, and of course the comedy also to break everything because. Once you have a, a film that is too serious, yeah. it just loses that impact. You have to break it up with comedic elements. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I wanted it to be fun. You know, I wanted it to be a fun film. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I knew that I wanted to make a science fiction film with horror elements. Um, but I also knew that at the end of the day, I wanted to make an adventure film. I wanted it to be an adventurous, fun ride for people. I wanted it to be like this kind of thrill ride. I wanted them to have all these experiences. Uh, and I wanted them to, you know, go to see the film and just have fun, you know, and then enjoy, enjoy a film. Because a lot of science fiction films nowadays rely too much on horror, I think, um, way too much on horror. And it just becomes this thing that's just a little too grim. Um, and I wanted to bring that fun back, almost like Close Encounters of the Third Kind. You know, when I first saw that film, it, just, it felt like this fun adventure uh, that was happening. Um, even War of the Worlds to some extent. Uh, which was hugely inspiring to me, or even science, you know, I just felt that it was this fun thing. And I wanted to, to have that move, that kind of move, that tone in Fighting in the Sky.
funny that you mentioned those films because each of those films, of course, they were taking source material from actual events. They elaborated it, of course, to make it more intense on screen and as a film. But each of those films were based on real life occurrences. War of the Worlds did occur. It, it was a, a spaceship over a military base and it was being shot at by artillery everything and the ship was still in the sky with the force field around it and they were there's actually one photograph about that incident too oh wow that's incredible that's and that's one of my favorite films that's that's even better wow that's amazing <laughs> actually yeah it was it, i believe it was during world war ii uh if I'm not mistaken, over in, in California, over the uh, military base, there were a lot of casualties, of course, because the artillery rounds would fall to the floor and, you know, people were on the floor and they get they would get killed by that. But oh yeah, it was actually documented and everything. Wow, yeah. I would have to look that up. That sounds like a movie right there. I mean, uh, War of the Worlds, a remake, <laughs> another one, who knows? That's crazy. During your research, I don't know if you have uh, come across the... Well, now it's now it's being declared a intergalactic spaceship that just went through our solar system. It was the Amuamua, that's what they were calling it. And at first they would describe this elongated vessel as a lost meteorite. But once the scientists started investigating the proportions of this thing, they realized, wait a second, it was actually using the gravitational pull of the sun to project itself through our solar system and away into the depths of the of the uh, of space that in itself deserves a oh film oh my god yeah <laughs> that sounds when did that happen by the way that sounds incredible I, I you know i didn't come across that one that happened uh 2018 mid 2018 okay. even even stephen hawking when yeah. he before he passed away he was conducting his research on that and he came to the conclusion that it was artificial. Oh my gosh. Wow. Well, uh, I hope they come back during the time of the release of Fighting the Sky, you know, so we can have a promotion <laughs> movie. We're like, hey guys, you know, we made a movie about you, you know. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, exactly. Put a bumper sticker on their, on their vessel or something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah put, put the flyer, like, you know, watch Fighting the Sky. <laughs> with, with Fighting the Sky, uh, a little bit behind that process, why does it take the a film so long in an independent circuit to be completed and into the production phase? That is a good question. Um, you know, and it's interesting because it shouldn't have taken as long as it did, but the, the, what happened was we had a, we had a lot of different cuts. There were a lot of different versions of the movie. So we started editing fighting the sky when we back in 2015, we, we finished it last year, the movie, um, and um, we, we filmed it in 2015, and then we started to assemble a cut. And then my first editor uh, resigned. He said it was just too overwhelming. He just said he couldn't handle how much footage we had. And, you know, we, we, there was no script to go by. It was kind of, you know, just a statement. So he became <laughs> overwhelmed. And I don't blame him. He's a good friend. I don't okay. blame him. Uh, so then we went to uh, okay. our second editor. And our second editor in Los Angeles, uh, he gave us this rough cut of the movie and we just didn't like it. Uh, we didn't like it. He didn't even, mm. he didn't even honestly, uh, cut together half the, like a lot of the scenes. He cut out a lot of the scenes and I'm like, where, where's like 30 minutes of the movie? Like where, you know, where's this other stuff that we filmed? And he was like, Oh, I just didn't think that fit the pacing. So I didn't edit it. And I'm like, um, no, you have to okay. edit the whole movie. Then we, you know, he, he almost <laughs> was trying to direct the way that the movie was, you know, being cut together. Um, so then we had to start from scratch again. So then we went, to, we went to oh. my third editor, uh, in Ohio, which is where I'm from. And then he started editing okay. and then he just said, I, I can't, I'm sorry, but this is just so much. Like, it's just the crazy <laughs> amount plus the visual effects. Like, so that was, uh -huh. you know, after a few, a few weeks, he just couldn't do it. So then, you know, and at, at that point, you know, like a year and a half had passed by of like getting all these different cuts and like all these versions and none of them panning out. And then finally in 2017, I was like, that's it. I'm doing it myself. Like if anyone can do it, I'm just going to have to do it myself. I can't keep going to, you know, from editor to editor to editor. I just have to do it myself. So then I did. Right. I started from zero. So after seeing all these different versions of the movie, uh, 
it was the hardest, honestly, one of the hardest things I've had to do was just start from zero and, and start editing the movie from scratch. Uh, and I took it a scene at a time. And uh, yeah, and then it took me like, you know, several months to complete it. And then in 2018, we were finally like rounding the turn at the, uh, you know, back in January 2018, we were like, okay, now we're finally like, you know, really implementing the CGI. We're really implementing the, the music, the score by uh, TJ Wilkins. Um, and it finally was coming together. Like I felt like after years of like different versions and cuts and things that didn't pan out, we were finally, it was finally taking the tone that we wanted. And uh, yeah, and that's kind of how we, we finished the movie. I've heard it time and time again that editing of editing the part of uh, after the filming is where it would make or break the film. And, and what you have just elaborated on is true testament to that uh, theory. Uh, if a film is cut a certain way, it just doesn't have that proper vibe. And once it goes into d distribution, there's nothing you could there's nothing else you could do about it that's how it is so it's it's very important to really carefully edit the footage how it's supposed to be in order to tell a proper story I completely agree and you know in the way that some of these editors were, were cutting it together it was I, I thought particularly too quick sometimes i like to um, you know i like okay. to you know really absorb an image i really like to see shots i like to see the dollies i like to see you know, the, the slow moving mm -hmm. things instead of just kind of like quick cut, quick cut, quick cut. Like I just, like a YouTube editing in a way. And I just feel like that's not right. cinema. To me, that's not cinema. That's just like, you know, having your mind just kind of like wander off on the screen and, you know, by showing them so many different things. And, and I wanted to let the edit breathe. I wanted to really just let, you know, the, you know, the moments, you know, breathe and then have really different kind of pacing, like a proper cinema pacing. And that to me was the biggest issue that I had mm. with these editing. And, and, you know, like, and you're right. And that's honestly, you know, when you have a particular vision, uh, you know, sometimes you just have to be really adamant about what you want. And if not, then do it yourself. Being a independent filmmaker, there's also that line that you have to uh, walk between an entrepreneur and a filmmaker. And the entrepreneur part is, of course, you're creating a product for general masses consumption. Uh during wearing those type of hats business wise and artistic wise uh, what advices do you have for up and coming filmmakers who have to deal with both of these things well first of all i would like to tell these filmmakers not to be overwhelmed by everything because you have to know how to be a businessman you almost have to train yourself how to be a businessman no one's you know no one will really teach you and say this is the way that you should do it uh, or, you know, they can, but really you're just going to have to learn on your own. So I, I always have to say that you have to keep pushing. If you believe in your project enough, that other people are going to believe in your project enough. You just have to convince them this is going to be successful because of this. Uh, and always have a strategy. Always, you always want to be the smartest person when you're pitching your movie and when you're trying to get your ideas off the ground because no one's, no one's going to fight harder for you than you. So I like to, you know, always keep your creative side, you know, keep that locked away for yourself. But when it comes to this, this business, always think, you know, be open-minded, obviously, but always think about the end result. Always think about the product uh, and always keep pushing forward. Looking at your INDB, you have a slate of films in pre-production, but what can we expect on the horizon? What can you share? Because I know some films you cannot be shared because of, uh, uh they're in production but what can be shared yeah um yeah it's interesting yeah i have so many that we're prepping honestly but um it's funny because the one that we have been prepping is not on imdb i mean my next film is not on imdb <laughs> which is the funniest thing um we have been for the last several months uh preparing a project called while we're here and it is a coming-of-age drama about a, a group of teenagers enjoying their summer before college. Um, it's like a mix of mm, Days of the okay. Confused, a uh, mix of American Graffiti, but for, but for a contemporary audience. Um, and it's 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 the most personal film that I've that I've done to date. Uh, so I've been writing that film for a very long time now, and we're just getting ready to start casting. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm really, really excited. There's no aliens in this movie. There's no blood. There's no gore. It's like completely 180 from you know the last thing that I did. So this is going to be really great. 
You're writing the script. Oh my god! Can you believe it? There's going to be a script with this movie. <laughs> so, yeah, that'll be a big change for me too. I'd be like, "What is this? What is this piece of paper? I don't understand." <laughs> to close out the interview, uh, just open platform, uh, plug in, plug away, fight in the sky. What audience will expect? Where it can be found in social media platforms? Yes. Very good. Fighting the Sky uh, is being distributed by High Octane Pictures, our amazing distributors. Uh, and it comes out February 5th on DVD and digital. It can be found on Amazon, Amazon Prime, um, Vudu, Xbox, uh, Dish Network On Demand. Um, gosh, I don't know. So I have a lot of other streaming devices. You just have to check all these streaming devices. It's kind of coming out on many different platforms. And uh, yeah, they can follow us on social media. All the handles are at Fighting the Sky. Uh, we're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, we're on Instagram, and people can follow the movie there. So. Great, great. And no social media handles for Fighting the Sky? No, those are for Fighting the Sky, yeah. So uh, at Fighting the Sky, uh, oh, okay. yeah, on Instagram, uh, Facebook, and Twitter. Uh, and, and for my personal studio, uh, uh, at Conrad Studios, on Instagram, uh, Twitter, and Facebook. Uh, cool, cool. Uh, th uh, thank you so much once again for this interview opportunity for your time discussing Fight in the Sky aliens yes. <laughs> and uh, and filmmaking uh, great topics yes, all around this is incredible <laughs> thank you for having me this is this is amazing segment 2 television and streaming Penny Dreadful City of Angels cast developments Showtime is reprising the series Penny Dreadful and it's going to have a Latino centered narrative. The cast developments include actress Natalie Dormer, Daniel Sovato, Jessica Garza, and Jonathan Nieves. Titled Penny Dreadful City of Angels. It would feature the creator, writer, and executive producer of the original long-running series Penny Dreadful, John Logan. Penny Dreadful City of Angels will be set against a 1938 Los Angeles backdrop. Some of the plot lines will include political tension, a grisly murder that shocks the city, the development of Los Angeles in the era which included the first freeways and last but not least a deep tradition of a Mexican-American folklore. Actress Natalie Dormer will portray the role of Magda, a supernatural demon who can take the appearance of anyone she chooses and manifest in a number of guises throughout the story. Actor Daniel Sovato will portray the role of the detective Thiago Vega. No word yet on the release for Penny Dreadful City of Angels, but I applaud the Mexican Latino centric theme in this new upcoming horror series from Showtime. Even the poster art pays homage to the Dia de la Muerte artwork and Mexican culture. We just gotta have to wait and see how the Latino community and also Latino supernatural folklore is entwined in the plot for this upcoming series especially the how it blends with the subplot of the third right and the rise of radio evangelism in 1938 los angeles penny dreadful was a series that started off with a bang and slowly declined the final season was not it left more answers than questions, in my opinion, and I am definitely looking forward to this reinvigorated horror series from Showtime with a new slate of cast, characters, and a new plot. Let's see if this particular series will be a limited run 
or will we see more installments or perhaps an, un- an anthology series based on Penny Dreadful? Perhaps the second season of this new installment will be set in a different era with m- different characters. S- with case in point such as American Horror Story. That is a great idea. That would be an amazing direction to go with, especially since Penny Dreadful had garnered a large following. The story was rich, and for those who haven't seen it, Penny Dreadful took elements of the classic vampire wolves and other creatures of the night and put them all together into one flowing plot. Let's see if that happens with this upcoming reinvigoration of the series. It should. Why not? As I said before, if it's an anthology series, that would be most welcome because there are so many avenues and possibilities that you can take. Just keeping the name Penny Dreadful, but changing the plot and keeping all these creatures of the night elements in play. The haunting second season plot revealed. The Haunting of Hill House proved to be one of the most popular horror series on Netflix. And it was no surprise to hear that a second season was going to be added. It will debut in 2020. And the title for this second season is The Haunting of Bly Manor. If you hop on over to Amazon.com, the short story the original work of henry james the turn of the screw to which this second season will be based off of it was originally published in 1898 and the synopsis is lengthy i'm going to read an excerpt based off the synopsis just to give us an idea of what to expect for the second season the manuscript tells the story of how the young governess is hired by a man who has become responsible for his young nephew and niece after the death of their parents. He lives mainly in London and is not interested in raising the children himself. The boy, Miles, is attending a boarding school while his younger sister Flora is living at a country estate at Exus. She is currently being cared for by the housekeeper, Miss Gross, the governess new employer, the uncle of Miles and Flora, gives her full charge of the children and explicitly states that she is not to bother him with communication of any sorts. The synopsis goes on to describe this tangled web of the these children, the governess uncle family interesting narrative and if it's any connection story wise development wise visually with the first season of the haunting of we can expect a really great horror treat from netflix the haunting of is a horror series created by Mike Flanagan and Trevor Macy and yes now we know this is going to be an anthology let's see how many more seasons the haunting of will continue how many stories will we see will each story have a deep rooted connection such as how American Horror Story has developed into over this past seasons on FX According to the report on Dateline back in February, the turning of the screw had many adaptations throughout the year. For those who are interested in the script, do check out the book, which is readily available on Amazon. You can download it to your mobile devices, reading devices, and get a glimpse of the storyline before it emerges onto a visual medium over at Netflix. Once again, The Haunting of Bly Manor will release in 2020. No specific date as of yet. 
Halo series heads to showtime. Love it or hate it, Halo, the video game franchise, solidified itself as first-person shooter and really catapulted the popularity of Xbox since it was a sole proprietary feature for the video game console. Halo has a series of books, it had animated films. A Halo TV series was originally scheduled in 2013 for the Xbox as part of its original content. But after Xbox Entertainment Studios shut down in 2014, Showtime found interest on the property and over the past four years have been developing this video game into a series. Of course, it had its bumps in the initial stages. Filming was supposed to begin in early 2019, but it was postponed when Rupert Wyatt, who was announced as the director and executive producer, dropped out of the project once the casting started to take shape. He was replaced with Otto Bathworth. He's set to direct and serve as executive producer for this upcoming Showtime series based on the video game. Initially, there were supposed to be 10 episodes for season one. It has since been condensed to nine episodes one episode short perhaps the storyline got trimmed so much that it went into nine season nine episodes for season one that's usually the case when there is a first run series there's always that testing the water process to see how many people tune in what would the target demographic be what would be the ratings be for the first installment all the way to the last one so hopefully halo would find success on showtime there have been mixed reviews on the video game series platforms as i opened up this segment with some hate the series some enjoy the series nevertheless it has a good story narrative even though the basic premise of the gameplay is run and shoot and kill aliens you have the protagonist master chief you have the invading aliens on the planet that they have to combat in to save humanity and all these little subplots that get involved into the plot the halo adaptation uh once again is based off of the video game and will focus on the universe that first came into play back in 2001. So we're going to find ourselves back into the story of how everything began, perhaps an origin story. So that way persons who are unfamiliar with video gaming and or the Halo video game series can jump right in and get a sense of who the characters are, what's going on, what are the subplots, what are the antagonists, what is their drive. Basically, Halo is takes place against the 26th century backdrop. This is the future. And there's a conflict between humanity and an alien race known as the Covenant. It'll be interesting to see how, the, hey, this is a video game. It's going to be translated to live action. Let's see how the special effects are going to be. That is, this is something that you would normally see on the sci-fi channels since they are notorious for creating great visuals for their series. Uh, not, not so much for their films with the campy graphics, but the series is top notch. So Showtime is really dishing out, really setting out an investment to showcase CGI, uh, green screen, and perhaps every other visual candy you can think of under the sun into this nine episodic season one.
no word yet on a specific release date but the production will begin later this year 2019 and as of the report which released in back in february uh, we could foresee this halo series to emerge on showtime perhaps uh, fourth quarter 2020 or first quarter 2021 lost boys tv series cast developments one of the most iconic films in horror cinema one that has garnered a following even has a fucking cool soundtrack is the 1987 release the lost boys the film is directed by joe schumacher and stars jason patrick corey Haim, diane wiest barnard hughes edward herman and Kiefer Sutherland. The synopsis to the film. After moving to a new town, two brothers discover that the area is a haven for vampire. Now, this is one of those films that com very well combines comedy and horror, especially with the R rating that it received. And that brings us to the topic of this segment. The Lost Boys is getting a TV series adaptation and it's heading on over to the CW. The leads have already been solidified and they include Keo Sanchez, Medani Rami, Dakota Shapiro. The series, the pilot that is, will be directed by Catherine Hardwick and yeah, it basically parallels the film itself here is a overview of the plot written by heather mitchell the lost boys is set in sunny seaside santa clara home to a beautiful boardwalk all the cotton candy you can eat and a secret world underworld of vampires after the sudden death of their father Brothers Michael and Sam Emerson move to Santa Clara with their mother Lucy, who hopes to start a new in the town where she grew up. But the brothers soon find themselves being drawn deeper and deeper into the seductive world of Santa Clara's eternally beautiful and youthful undead. The brother Michael will be portrayed by Tyler Posey, Kylie Sanchez will portray the role of Lucy, Sarah Hay will portray the role of Molly, Medallion Rami will portray the role of Stella, and Rio Magini will portray the role of Sam. Dakota Shapiro has the role of the character named David. No word yet on the release date for the television adaptation for the lost boys given that it, the pilot is already set in motion let's see if the pilot paves the way with the ratings that is for a continued series and if that continued series will lead to a season two most times uh, films don't translate well to television it's uh, let's say the track record is 50 50 you had minority report you had hannibal which had a good following both got can well hannibal got canceled minority report got canceled very fast um bates motel based off of the film also got canceled so the track record doesn't seem good that's not putting this tv series the lost boys into a negative context but let's see and find out so far we have a good looking cast uh very youthful uh perhaps as most of the series on the cw it would target a young demographic seeing that the cast is young let's see how the story pans out uh let's see hopefully that the translation of the film to tv does not get uh, too dry fast that was the case with the exorcist over at fox the first season was it based itself off the movie loosely but then season two basically was the same premise mm, that would definitely kill a, t a 
film to TV adaptation. Nevertheless, I'm looking forward to it. I haven't really tuned in to the CW at all with none of their content, especially for the DC universe. But I'll give this a try, especially since it's the Lost Boys. Come on. It's, as I mentioned earlier, it's so iconic in the horror cinema. That just leaves curiosity to see, okay, will it parallel the original content or will it succeed on its own merit? Exclusive interview. Filmmakers. Adam Rodness, Stuart Stone, Scarecrows. This weekend is gonna be legendary. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited too. And I've got one more surprise before we hit Paradise Beach. All right. Let's go. It's weird. What? The bird. Aren't scarecrows supposed to scare off birds? Obviously, this farmer doesn't know what scary means. Someone took the car? Hey. To kick off the interview, please provide um, a little bit about yourselves, an origin story and humble beginnings all, all the way up to what got you started in film creation. Well, 5-7 uh, Films has been around for... Uh, about three and a half years. Um, it was co-founded by myself and Stu. Um, Stu and I met uh, when I was a... We were teenagers, I think, right? We were teenagers? I was a teenager. Stu was way older than me, but he won't admit that. Um, I ended up marrying his sister, out of all things, and then we were forced to work together for the rest of our lives. Um, but uh, I came up... Uh, you know, as, a, as, as an actor, uh, I wanted to get my, my teeth sunk into the TV and film industry. Um, and then, you know, auditioning as an actor was always very, you know, tough. And it was, uh, it was something that nobody really ever wants to do for the rest of their lives. So we decided, hey, why not try to make our own content and start writing and producing our own stuff? And then, you know, we can put ourselves in our own films and, and TV shows down the road. And, and the idea spawned um, a few years back, and we were able to find some great partners um, who believed in our concepts and our ideas. And uh, we came out of uh, the gate with our first movie um, called The Haunted House on Kirby Road, which is a, uh, a stoner horror film based on true events that happened just north of Toronto mm. in Canada. And uh, that led to... Uh, Another film called Scarecrows, which has now been released. Uh, it was released December 11th, and now it's having its big uh, DVD release, February 1st. So Stu and I, you know, we, we, we write these films, um, and Stu directs the film, and I produce the film, and we're on the ground running, wearing 15 different hats, um, you know, trying to just entertain people all the while. So mm -hmm. it's been uh, quite the ride thus far, and we're happy that we're, you know, sitting right here talking with you. And, oh, great. Uh, I'm Stu. Hi, how are you? Good, how are um, you? I, my background is uh, I grew up, uh, I was a child actor growing up, and I was in, uh, you know, a bunch of, uh, you know, TV shows and movies and cartoons and stuff like that as a kid, and uh, ended up sort of, you know, growing up on set, I always wanted to, you know, you're always curious about like the other aspects of, you know, what are the other hats you can wear? And, you know, once I got to be in my 20s and eventually in my 30s, you know, you kind of get burnt out of doing the same thing all the time. You want to try new things. And the opportunity came about to get behind the camera and start directing um, movies and, you know, horror movies was the perfect place to kind of jump in because A, I love horror and grew up watching it. And I feel like I grew up in like the golden age of slasher movies and, um, you know, before things went all snuffy on us. And, uh, you know, when you're making independent films, horror is a great genre because it's a genre that the people who watch the films are coming to watch it specifically because they want to get scared or they want to see a horror movie, not because of necessarily who's in it. So 
as an independent filmmaker, you don't need to rely on having like big Hollywood stars to get your movie going. You need a cool concept and a cool script. That's the way to get it going, which uh, really spoke to us. And um, luckily enough, we've been fortunate enough to make uh, a couple movies now, and it's going pretty great. And Scarecrows is, like Adam said, is coming out February 1st on DVD, and it's out now on VOD, and it's getting some good reviews, including... You know, we were floored by the review that you guys gave us, which was so kind. And, um, you know, it's, it's, we're, we're at that stage where, you know, you got to read all the reviews and you get really excited when people sort of get what you're trying to do. And, you know, we wanted to, you know, first and foremost, let you know that, you know, your support for independent film is not unnoticed. And, you know, your, your review for our film specifically, you know, motivated us to, you know, keep going. and. You know, I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. I guess we'll find out. But, you know, we appreciate guys like you who, you know, the, who are the real, you know, lifeblood of, of this genre. So thanks for having us. The origin story that you guys provided jumped into a lot of context on indie film. And one just stood out for me right now with, with what you had mentioned is the fact that filmmakers especially starting out have the impression that they need to acquire a named actor it doesn't even have to be a list actor it could be uh, someone prominent in the genre in order to boost their films and of course that is important if you want to market the film as a product but if you have the passion and artist you want to put out art that's where you have to decide do you want to put this name actor increase your budget and put out a product or do what you love create art and see what the fans and the community responds to it you know i think there's <clears throat> you you there's uh a few different ways to attack that comment but mm -hmm. you know number one like the first way is okay budget do you have the money to afford any kind of recognize, recognizable name or face. Right. In most cases with independent filmmakers, that answer will be no. <laughs> so then your next thing is, okay, can we come up with a concept that will replace that star power and really just drive it to the story so that people can actually put themselves in the situations that you're creating and not have to rely on this famous face to lead them through an hour and a half of storytelling. So I think that, you know, as filmmakers that we are, we are story driven, you know, producers. That's, that's the thing that we know that people are going to tune in for. So having a star in your movie, yes, it's, it's great. Is it going to help the box office? I'm sure it will. But without it, you know, you still have the opportunity to create an amazing story and also, you know, not have to succumb to the pressures of the studio and, and you know, and, and having more money, you could actually go and, and go and do what you want to do and create what you want to create, but just by having the means of, of your own brain. But also just to add on to that point, like two quick little sub points, as I said earlier, you know, horror is like the one genre that can survive without a star. Because like I said, the people who are going to see a horror movie are going to see it because it's a horror movie, not because of who's in it. So that's a clear, decisive advantage right out of the gate. The second thing is that, you know, horror movies aren't necessarily, it's not a genre that like necessarily attracts big Hollywood names to be in them in the first place. It's a place where Hollywood stars are discovered. Because, you know, if you look back at the track record over the last 30, 40 years of horror movies, there have been plenty of like A-list stars that have, made their on-screen debuts in horror films. And that's because horror movies are the only opportunities for an unknown actor to even audition for a lead role in a film. So, you know, it's, uh, it's horror in a lot of ways is a, a, almost like a feeder system to mainstream Hollywood uh, to find the next big superstars, you know? You, you, it's very rare that I've seen a horror movie that was, you know riding on the shoulders of some big celebrity to give it a big opening weekend. I mean, Halloween just did record numbers. And yes, it was really cool that Jamie Lee Curtis was in it. But the star of the movie is Michael Myers. The star of Friday the 13th, Jason. Freddy Krueger is the star of the uh, reason why you go see Nightmare on Elm Street. It's the, these fictitious, amazing bad guys are the stars. You know? Um, so, I mean, 
I, I hope that kind of answers your your question. But you know, it's it's uh, creatively horror is like the best space to go into. You can get messy. There's less rules, and you can tell pretty much any kind of story you want. And you know, there's an audience that will either like love it or hate it, but they'll feel something. Right. And you make up a good point there. Uh, and it made, me, it made me laugh when you mentioned it because there's one particular actor who port he had a role in one of the Texas Chainsaw movies. I'm not going to name the name, but he kind of regrets ever, that movie ever being released and his portrait in that movie. But it just falls on what you had just mentioned. A-list actors get their start in the horror genre. And uh, yeah, I have seen it throughout the years. And uh, th this is a genre that the antagonist is the is the icon the the prominent force in every movie and for scarecrows the both of you chose a theme and an, an antagonizing force that is it's common in horror but at the same time it doesn't have the recognition as jason or michael myers for some reason uh and that is the scarecrow. So what was the idea behind this character uh, focusing on this antagonizing force? Well, I mean, we've all... Basically, scarecrows are pretty scary to begin with. I mean, just in general. The whole point of a scarecrow is to scare birds and scare people. So, like, just, the t just its existence is used to be scary. And as a kid, we were obviously both very scared of scarecrows. And as an adult, you know, I'm deaf, I'm still scared of scarecrows. But Adam was on a vacation with his wife, and they happened to drive through a town that was having a scarecrow festival. So the, the, this, this town was called, I was driving from Los Angeles to San Francisco, and on your way to that, uh, on that drive, there's a, a small town called Cambria. And Cambria holds this annual scarecrow festival. And on, on each of the, um, the on each uh, of the fronts of, of each uh, place, like if, if there's a restaurant, if there's a baseball card shop, um, if there was a lawn bowling place, there would stand a scarecrow. And the scarecrow would be dressed in a baseball uni uniform or as dressed as a maitre d' or dressed as a lawn bowler. And they'd be kind of frozen in time. but they would be scarecrows. So driving through this town, which is one street, I said to my wife, holy shit, what if those are actual, you know, real people? What if, you know, these people have been like kidnapped and what if they're going to be left there to die or they're like, and everyone else just kind of taking pictures with them and they're, and someone's living underneath the scarecrow or dying. costume or, you know, dying. And, and that's where the idea spawned <laughs> we're in each other's head yeah <laughs> i mean we've seen movies in the past where like the scarecrow itself was like a monster or a bad guy or you know but we've never seen a movie where the scarecrow is the victim you know it's like imagine if you will being kidnapped and tortured and put hung up as a scarecrow and you can't escape and you're just left to die up on the cross as a scarecrow that would be a horrific way to die um so, you know, immediately the idea started kind of percolating into, uh, you know, we got to make a farmer and the farmer wants to kill people who are trespassing on his property and turns them into scarecrows. And the scarecrows aren't the bad guys. The scarecrows are the victims. And like that was sort of our twist. And you know, the studio that um, we did The Haunted House on Kirby Road, our first film with, loved the idea and greenlit it. And here we are. We got to make another movie, which was which was really cool. And um you know, like I said, there's other scarecrow type ideas floating around. I mean, there's pretty much any idea you can think of has been done already. But we thought, you know, having the scarecrows as the victim was like a fresh kind of new take on this. And hopefully we managed to pull it off. As well, you have, you know, back to the antagonist part, you know, we decided to, you know, if you haven't seen the movie, I mean, there's not, there's no diet, like our, our, our antagonist doesn't speak. You, you we, we, for that reason is we wanted the audience to kind of make up, you know, their own decisions on what this guy is thinking and, and, and kind of try to get into his own head. And I also, think without having a bad guy like that talk, which has also been a reference to the Michael Myers, you know, uh, these bad guys who are just silent characters are a lot more freaky 
um, than when you hear someone speak. And I think that when you have someone that has a lot of dialogue, you automatically, you can start seeing, you know, oh, they are a real person. You know, I can communicate with them. Right. That whole kind of monstrous attitude is out the window where you leave someone silent. There's not a lot. For you, you, you can't really read on, on what these people are thinking. That was like the other sort of fresh take we were trying to approach. Like Adam said, you know, the best villains that we remember, of course, Michael Myers and Jason, they didn't talk. But they were also like behind a mask. Our farmer is a human being who doesn't speak. So, you know, that's pretty scary. Like, what the fuck is this guy thinking? Um, you know, it, if you look at the history of film, you know, with James Bond and Arnold Schwarzenegger in their movies, they would say, like, funny things before they, like, did terrible things, you know? And I think Freddy Krueger is a great example of that kind of being taken to the next level, like in Nightmare on Elm Street 3, you know? He always had something, like, funny to say before he, like, cut someone's head off. Um, you know, maybe in the future we'll take that approach with one of our bad guys, but, you know, for this one, we thought it'd be best if he just shut the fuck up and just killed people. And it would have changed the whole tonality of the film if he had... If the if the farmer would have had uh, those sarcastic or funny puns before his killing, it, yeah, it would change the tone entirely. And there's a there's a time and a place for that. And I am I really favor when the antagonist is the quiet type, the reserved type, because in horror cinema, believe it or not, for actors, I find that. It's a quite a challenging genre to portray a role because not only do you have to say the lines, but if you don't have lines, you have to convey to the audience dread, fear, uh, being a bad guy or bad gal, whatever the case may be. So there's a lot of c layers of complexity when portraying a certain role in horror cinema. Yeah, no, for sure. And... Um, Jason J. Thomas, the actor who plays uh, the killer in our film, he did a great job. And like you said, it was, you know, it was very challenging. It had to be for him to, you know, pull off what he pulled off without getting to, you know, sort of speak and let his eyes and his small, subtle movements kind of have to tell the story. Um, I remember there was actually one point when we were shooting some stuff in the cornfield and he, he said, do you mind if I get a line now? <laughs> <laughs> and he was just supposed to say the word hello. And it was just one word. And when we were looking through the cut, and we were kind of on our fine cut, that word hello actually made the fine cut. But when we went to the final cut, we decided just to strip it all. Because if he was going to talk once, it has to count. It has to really matter. Yeah, but no. right. we just decided to, to, to start the whole thing. Maybe if we do a sequel, Scarecrow's 2 Farmer's Market, we'll give him, <laughs> we'll give him some Farmer's Market. <laughs> Which may or may not be a reality. You, may, you never know with us. Could be, it could be in production. You don't, you don't know. Oh, uh, well, but for indie filmmaking, uh, one of the aspects of being the, the creator is to come up with innovative ideas and of course uh, as i mentioned we uh, the scarecrows has been touched upon as just about any other topic has touched upon but the fact of the matter is as a filmmaker and as a writer to really change the element change everything and create something new and innovative and that's in my opinion what the horror community are thirsty for are yearning for especially with Hollywood always dishing out the reboots left and right. We have the indie filmmakers. We leave it up to them to really take something that is there and rechange it and present it to the market. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're 100% right. And that's something that we love doing. And also in this genre, we also know that like there's an audience of wolves out there that, you know, you put these movies out and you... There's, there's, there's horror fans that only watch the movies because they can't wait to rip them apart, you know? <laughs> and there's that, there's that element too, which, you know, as long as they're watching the movie, I don't rip apart, go ahead. Right. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's like those, those films that sort of break through and break out of that mold of just being kind of campy horror movies that end up having the staying power. And of course, that's the goal of probably every uh, filmmaker. But, uh, you know, specifically that's our goal as, you know, with our company is that we're trying to sort of rise above the rest and, and sort of make an impression on people so that 
you know, when we put out our next movie, we have, we build a following like that same cult following that's going to just follow us along on our journey. And hopefully our stories will continue to get better and bolder and braver. And, you know, our budgets will go up and the game will change a little bit, but you know, it's, you're, you're a hundred percent right. It's all about innovating at this level and you don't really have the budget to get crazy with CGI and its special effects. So it's really old school filmmaking at its finest in a lot of ways, you know, you got to be practical with your killing and your blood and your guts and the chasing. And people don't realize that these movies are shot for so little in so little time that the fact that they're even finished is, is a miracle. So, you know, kudos to all the filmmakers out there that, that get their movies finished and, and watched and reviewed and get interviewed on decay. And, you know, it's, it's a tough journey to get, to get from beginning to end on these films and, definite shout out to all the hardworking filmmakers out there that are that are living it and doing it mm. Th that, that's absolutely correct and the time involved in creating a film uh, i've heard it time and time again you could create you could shoot a film here we're, we're speaking here 20 2019 imagine you're shooting a film now that film won't be released until a couple of years later or a year and a half later right. all just to create the film in post getting the effects whether it's practical or cgi a labor of love in most cases and in the indie film the the that's what's really driving the film not really the budget but it's just the passion to put out a project 100% <clears throat> you are 100% correct in that in that assessment and the crew the actors the directors the music everybody from top to bottom is in it for the love of filmmaking and you don't find that in other genres because there is nobody's getting rich on these movies unless you create Blair Witch or some crazy shit <laughs> but like everybody is doing it because they love making movies or they love the genre and even the crew like you know nobody's getting rich everybody's there because they want to be and I think that really it really comes across in the final product uh, when a movie works You're, you, it's because everything clicked on all cylinders and you know what I mean? It was a real true collaborative team effort. And you know, it's not my, it's not because of me or because of Adam that the movie came out the way that it did. It's because of me and Adam and the actors and the crew and the caterer and the sound guy and the colorist, everybody had to come together to make this happen. So, you know, it's, it's a really cool genre to be a part of and we're thrilled to be a part of it. And we're thrilled that we're being, you know, sort of accepted by the community. And, you know, we hope that this is a, a long lasting relationship that goes on for many years. Right. And, and Stu and Adam, interesting thing here with the horror community, once you create a film, whether it's good or bad, that, that's beside the point. The, the thing is, once you create a film and, and it's put out for consumption, it the horror community embraces it. And... It struck me as funny that the car community, some members of the community, embraced Scarecrow's a little bit too much. And recently, you, the both of you had to release a public service announcement regarding this film. What the hell was that all about? Coming <laughs> up with you, uh, we'll email it to you because I'd love for you to read it. But we sort of wrote this sort of like, uh, you know... Uh, Case study, like, you know, <laughs> our, our observations of this whole thing, and it's it's quite an interesting read, and um, I, I would love to send it to you to check it out after. But you know, it, listen, good attention, bad attention, it's all attention. So the fact that people are doing this, they shouldn't be doing it, but for a movie like ours, it's sort of like a, a blessing and a curse. It's a curse because we don't want to get in trouble, but it's a blessing because you know it just adds fuel to the fire to you know even promote the film you know people hear that people are doing this they're like well what is it what's so what is it about this movie that's making people do this and then they'll go watch the movie so you know you know at this stage in the game we kind of kind of use use anything to our advantage to try to stand out and you know we're not bird box we don't have 85 million people that watch our movie but we have a million that watch it on youtube so it's a start Yeah. There's one thing that money can't buy, and that's organic. And if something is happening happening organically, that is the 
ultimate victory. And so, you know, we're finding that with this film and it's been, we've been high-fiving, believe me, we're, we've been high-fiving. But you're right though, because like you don't have marketing dollars, you don't have promotional dollars, you can't go out and put up billboards, you know, there's just no money for that. So we, we rely on word of mouth. We rely on this is, and sharing, and this is the ultimate way, you know, of, of sharing. So it's been, uh, it's been a pleasant surprise. Right. Exactly. And that all comes from marketing. Marketing is such an ex expensive, and if it's not expensive, it's time consuming because you have to jump on every social media platform to promote your film, and it's a never ending cause to just push it out there as many eyes as, as you want on your product at any given time. You do. And like you only, listen, you put in what could be close to a year and a half of work. And then what are you supposed to do? Just sit there and wait for people to, you know, come across it one day on a red box or, you know, hopefully you, know, you gotta be, you gotta, you gotta be a hustler, man. You gotta go out. You got to, you know, yes, do all the social media pages, do as many interviews as possible, you know, do what you need to do so that you could put the word on the street. And, you know, it's only going to help you as a filmmaker you know, to get the attention of other financiers and studios and producers who, you know, see an appetite for your work. So all in all, you know, it's like a three year process, you know, really from, from, from script to production, to post, to the release, you know, there's still a couple of movies that we've done that are still yet to come out that will hopefully get a release in 2019. You know, there's just like, there's just like a time and a place for everything. So it's all about, there's a lot of luck um, and teaming up with the right people. But, you know, again, uh, Scarecrows is, is, is making a mark and we're really excited for, to show everybody what we have next on our slate. And uh, it's going to be a very exciting year. In my opinion, I think the billboards and the radio ads, even the TV ads seems archa archaic in today's landscape where everything is digital and I don't, everybody's streaming, everybody's on YouTube and Facebook and utilizing that tool, those tools to promote a film. I think as an independent filmmaker or filmmaker just starting out is so important. It's just, and that in itself, it's a beast, just like uh, creating the film itself. You need to devote so much time and, and effort into that. For sure. And we have, you know, like five, seven films, we have, you know, four guys who are really, we're meeting bi-weekly, you know, we're developing projects. We work our asses off. We're writing in-house, you know, we're, we're going out and having finance meetings, we're finding investors, we're, you know, trying to, you know, just, you know, up the ante of the production and, you know, you have no other choice. That's just, that's also, what it is. like, we love movies and when you love what you're doing, it's not really, I mean, it's work, but it's much better than bagging groceries. You know what I mean? It's like, doesn't, it's, it's if you can have fun and be doing what you're passionate about for your job, that's the dream, man. Now, if we could, you know, break out with, uh, with some financial success with these movies, that would be even better, but we're on our way. You know, the path is, we're on the right path. And, you know, with guys like you who are supporting and, you know, the following that we're starting to sort of build, you know, the sky is the limit. And, uh, you know, that's why we don't take it for granted when there's people that are out there saying good things about our stuff. You know, we don't take that for granted at all because that's so important at this stage for us is to have, that's the proof of concept right there. You know, we made a movie, you said it's good. That helps us. You know what I mean? Uh, it's the people, you know, most people who can't, like I said earlier, who, you know, a lot of people, especially in, on the internet, they, it's like a troll kind of generation where they can't wait to rip things apart. Um, it's so much easier to log online and say how shitty something is. And it's much harder and rarer to have somebody that actually likes something, take the time to write something about it. So we don't take it for granted and we appreciate it. And, you know, it, that's what that's what keeps us going. Oh, oh, absolutely. And that's the best thing of being a content creator and a filmmaker is you, you don't know what the next day brings and having all those ideas on the slate is, is just as exciting to get them off the ground and presenting them to the to the public. You're right. And I can tell you that no matter 
if your budget of a movie is a dollar or ten million dollars, the audience is still judging it the exact same way. They are comparing your one dollar budgeted movie to a ten million dollar budgeted movie. There's no dis- there's no disconnect. They don't understand, and which is fine. And that's it's again like you know. Well, we for example, Scarecrows gets compared to Jeepers Creepers a lot, which is obviously a great you know successful film. Our movie was made on the catering budget of Jeepers Creepers. <laughs> So the fact that, you know, we like, it's like, how can you even compare the two? But they do. So it's like, you know, we're being judged by the same, you know, under the same magnifying glass, which is, which is true, which only makes us work harder to try to, you know, not only are we trying to get you to watch a movie, we're trying to fool you into thinking that it would, that, that it was $20 million that it cost us to make it. Which is also, again, very flattering because when you, when you get compared to those big budgeted movies, it's like, wow, you know, we're in that. They think and they believe, and we also believe that we're in that category. And it just shows like what we could do on such a small indie budget. And you know, as we grow and grow and grow, we hope just to like deliver more and more and more. So. And as you said about like things can go wrong on the set, and they usually do. Well, you're 100% right about that. And I'll give you a very brief example of that. Uh, the movie Scarecrows. There, there's crows in it. There's a bird in the in the movie. So. A crow is not exactly like a trainable animal, right? It's like a wild bird. So we found one guy, <laughs> one guy in within 200 miles that had a crow that he claimed was trained. So he got the job. Now, hold on. Let me preface this for a second. On the shooting schedule, this was supposed to be up first to get rid of two things in filmmaking you never want to really do is stay away from kids and animals. And animals. Yeah. So we were like, all right, let's shoot the animal first. Get first day, way. hardest thing out of the way, concentrate on the blood gorts and all guts and all that fun. But we decided to do it on, I think it was like the second last day of shooting. Yes. Well, that's because that was when the crow was available or something. Or no, something. no, no, no. No, because he was booking out a, he was booking out a booster on some other gig. Whatever the, whatever the case may be, it went from shooting on day one, we pushed it to the second last day of shooting. And on the day of shooting, of course, uh, we're waiting for the crow to arrive, and Adam gets the phone call that the crow has died. The crow, yeah. the one crow that we had, a real authentic crow, died. It got mauled by a minx. No joke. The morning of, it's 6.30 in the morning, and the wrangler calls me to say there's no crow coming to set. So what are we going to do? Because we have, we have, we need a crow for the movie. <laughs> so <laughs> if you notice, well, you could actually see this is a little behind the scenes here, which is actually awesome because I don't think anyone really noticed. But for those op- that opening scene in the movie, if you look very, very, very carefully, all the close-up shots of the bird pecking, of the bird pecking is actually a clothespin. A, a clothespin puppet that we made. On the spot. On the with spot. With a sharpie and a clothespin. That we had to make and took fake feathers and made our own animatronic crow that I put my hand in and started pecking at the head. <laughs> luckily, luckily, we got a call. We got a call from the guy later on in the day that he found, somehow he found another crow. It was a raven. Oh, it was a raven. So we had to substitute a crow for a raven. Which they looked the same enough so he brings this raven to the set right that's not a trained crow and there's all, the only way to get it to do something is to like feed it meat so we had to like bring in raw meat and put it on the actor's head and hope that this raven was gonna like go for it literally you roll camera and like you're like action and like the raven does nothing you're, we waited for about 45 minutes for this fucking bird to do anything <laughs> And it like took hours to get the bird to even do anything, and it's funny because the edit it worked out really, really great. But that's one of those things, like you said, it's like, you know, what's gonna go wrong will go wrong. You know, our art director, uh, when we first got on the set, uh, our AD was like, okay, everybody, just know that this is like an old farmland. Be careful. You never know. Just like, don't walk around. You know, look where you're walking. Oh my god. Within minutes. Our art director steps on a nail and it goes through his foot. He has to be rushed to the hospital. <laughs> they have like tetanus shots and all that shit. No he's joke. gone. So now we're going to have to make, figure out the blood and the guts because he's not there anymore. <laughs> like, these are the type of things I'm that go bit. wrong. And, you know, 
the great stories to tell when you're talking to, to K Magazine. But at the time, you know, it kind of made me want to smoke weed and go into the cornfield and get lost. The moral of the story is always shoot the animal on day one. Yeah, definitely. And, and that's the good thing about right now. We have digital cameras. Imagine shooting with regular film. Back then, film is expensive. <laughs> Uh, not a ch I, I I wonder how they made the movie Cujo. Like, how did they? Do, how much film did they use on that with that dog? <laughs> in shooting scarecrows, uh, the the topic of budget came up in the conversation uh, not so long ago. Uh, giving budgeting to create a film such as this, I hear most of the times that for some strange reason, filmmakers that are creating horror don't put the effort of putting a budget at the side for practical effects, which that is the core of every horror film. Uh, with that said, uh, how important was it also to have practical effects for the scene, and especially with CGI being so popular nowadays, too? I mean, to, to be honest with you, I'm speaking on behalf of me, but I think, Adam, I'm not really a fan of CGI anyway. Um, you know, I like my Star Wars movies when there's a guy inside the suit. Um, but, you know, at this budget level, you can't, it's not even really an option to go CGI. You have to go practical. Um, you know, my background, I used to work as a producer for the Chris Angel television show. So, you know, getting to see the magic of Chris Angel or, you know, TV magic and how practical effects are done, I think that that had a, a, a huge influence on our confidence to be able to pull off uh, practical effects. But yeah, I mean, listen, when you see guys falling, they're really falling. When you see, you know, it's like there's no green screen in our movie. <laughs> there's no, well, everything you see is what you get. And I think that also when you're asking an audience to suspend their disbelief, that's the best way to do it is to do it real. And, you know, I always prefer that. I mean, there's very few movies that are like loaded with CGI that aren't these like $200 million movies that, you know, that I watch and I, and, and I don't get taken out of the moment because I'm like, oh, this is so fake. Um, but that's just personal preference, maybe. I don't know, Adam. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, to attest to what Stu's saying, there's, listen, there's some stuff that you, that you can do that you could afford, which is like some blood enhancement or like, you know, let's, let's, let's make some blood splatter that we couldn't get the exact splatter because we could only afford to shoot one or two takes on the, on the day. But I think the best way to make people cringe and the best way to make people wince is to do what looks the most authentic and and because as soon as you know that it's cgi your brain is like oh it's cgi it's a, that means it's not real it's, a, it's it's totally fake but if you could do it practical in camera it's like oh shit did, how, wait how did they do that like is that did they actually no they didn't is she still and like if you could start like screwing with their heads then that is what puts the perspective in the audience that oh my god this this could be real and that's where fear comes from the fear doesn't come from, oh my God, cool, that's a computer making that awesome image. It's like, holy shit, like that could actually happen to me because it's happening really to her. So practical for me all the way as much as possible. Um, yeah. Obviously there's some things you can't do practical, but you know, we're, when we're writing the script, we know what we can afford. That's the other thing that people don't consider. Like we know what our budget is and how we, long we have to shoot this thing. When we're writing the movie, we're making sure we don't write things that need CGI in the movie to begin with because we can't afford it. And, and that also comes with independent filmmaking. You bring up a good point with the script. Uh, that is the, the foundation of a film. Don't write a script that you want spaceships and a setting. Yeah, you could pull it off with some CGI because there are some softwares out there, but then... Th everything else comes into place you got to have special effects for guns or the aliens and the creature and there it goes your budget boy budget is going through the roof and with scarecrows you you guys created a story uh budget wise set in a cornfield and i see more a lot of filmmakers doing this 
filming in the wilderness poses its own challenges from Bigfoot movies to cornfields. And I see a lot of filmmakers are doing that in order to keep within the budget range one location or the open wilderness. I think that's a good play in, in storytelling in itself. You don't have to be in space. I mean, I hundred percent agree. Unless you're George Lucas and you can, you know, create <laughs> scale models. Yeah. You're a hundred percent right. I mean, when you're, if anybody who's listening to this is going to be an indie filmmaker of any kind, I mean, the number one advice we would give you is to, when you're writing your script or selecting your material, make sure it's producible. Like you just said, you know, make sure it's a location that you don't need to pay for if, if, if at all possible, like the wilderness. Uh, make sure you don't have too many characters in it because actors want to get paid. So you can't have too many characters. You can't have too many locations. You can't have too many stunts because then you're going to have to pay a stunt coordinator to come in. You know, you can't, you got to feed everybody. No one wants to eat pizza every day. So you got you know, it's like all of these things have to be in consideration. I'm proud to say that we've done two films and we've never fed anybody pizza. So I'm proud to say that we have accomplished that at least. Only if they really ask for it, though. But um, I think the other por- part before we, we take off is is really you know consistency too. You don't want to you want to make a film that's going to be consistent from the start to the finish. You don't want to blow your budget on like a you know absorbent opening title sequence with like all these crazy CGI awesome animation effects, and then the rest of your movie is like practical and like doesn't carry that same theme. Keep it consistent and keep it simple. And I think like that's where, you know, people really need to focus on is, is you can make a great movie and a great story come to life, you know, if you just pay attention to being consistent. And if you start blowing your, your wad on, you know, then a spaceship comes out of, and there's lasers and aliens for one scene, the rest of the movie, it's not going to feel like a consistent film. So that would be my next piece of advice as well. Also, like the music is so important in horror movies as well. You know, we we you can't afford to hire a, some famous person to score your movie unless they like are a friend or something. But we we do it all ourselves. We have to wear every hat. We Adam produces the movie. I direct the movie. We wrote the movie. I score the movie. You know, it's like we have to do everything. That's the only way to get it done. And I think that in in the end. It, it reflects in the project. You know, if we put 100% love and passion into something, it's going to show. And it's going to it's gonna transcend, you know, to the viewer, hopefully. Um, you know, you got to be prepared to put in the work. Absolutely. And, and Stu and Adam, kicking off this interview, uh, you started your company, uh, both coming from the actor's standpoint and started a company. Don't want to write around, of course, for the casting directed to 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 uh call you back from a from an audition but with that said you have two films under your belt is there uh plans of expanding perhaps on streaming platforms we have facebook that is available we have instagram that is available and of course everybody knows youtube is readily available for creating and streaming content on these platforms uh, of course. I mean, 100%. We are wide open for that type of forward thinking. And we're not idiots either. We see how the trends are going. You know, people are consuming content on their phones, on their tablets, on their computers. Appointment viewing is, 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 is it's a broken system. We actually just had a meeting this morning with somebody that was talking to us about wanting to get involved in, uh, us get involved in that type of stuff. We are definitely open to any and all of it. And we are not closed-minded when it comes to uh, how to distribute uh, content and wherever there is eyeballs, we are down to be there. You know what I mean? So yes, exactly. we are all over that type of thinking and hopefully, you know, in the next year or two, you'll be able to see some brand new stuff from us, uh, in those very places you just listed. Thank you so much for your time, Stuart and Adam. As a closing point for this interview, please plug in uh, Scarecrows, any information, including social media handles. Yeah, you can find us on Facebook, uh, Scarecrows. Look up Scarecrows. Uh, We are on Instagram. Follow our company, 5-7-Films. All spelled out, F-I-V-E-S-E-V-E-N, films with an S. Follow us on Instagram. 
Um, you can look at catch everything on our website, www.57films.com. And if you go to 57films.com forward slash scarecrows, you can actually read that that article that we wrote that I wanted you to, we're going to send to you anyway, but for people who are listening and also Adam Rodness and Stu Stone, we're on all the social media platforms as well. So you can follow us and catch, keep up to date with what we got going on. Uh, Haunted house on Kirby road. Our first film is out on iTunes and Amazon and scarecrows is out on VOD. And on February 1st, it will be available on DVD. So please definitely check it out. And thank you so much for the support. And hopefully We'll get to talk to you sooner than later about upcoming projects and we'll continue uh, to bug you about plugging our stuff uh, moving forward. Thank you so much for having us. Segment 3 Trailer First Impressions The Curse of L.A. Yorona I'm very sorry about your loss. It's your fault! I can't even imagine how you must feel. Your children. Mincing. Mincing. Are safe now. But have they heard her crying? Have they felt the sting of her tears? Kicking off our trailer first impressions is The Curse of La Llorona. The film is directed by Michael Chavez and written by Mickey Daltrey and Tobias Iconis. The synopsis. Ignoring the eerie warning of a troubled mother suspected of child endangerment, a social worker and her own small kids are soon drawn into a frightening supernatural realm. Producers behind The Curse of La Llorona is of course James Wan and if you're familiar with his work he's worked on The Conjuring, he's worked on numerous not per se horror films, I, in my definition would be horror thrillers. Being that the story instead of taking a direct approach with scares of course it has jump scares but with being having more scares than story i find it to be classified as a horror thriller case in point the last release the nun many were expecting the film to be full of scares and in which case it was more action adventure horror thriller oriented i foresee the same circumstance happening with the curse of la llorona i think based on the footage provided and what we find in the trailer that would be the case we're not seeing something horror horrific we're going to be seeing uh, something along the lines of a psychological thriller a horror thriller the scenes that we find here in the trailer would most likely be peppered throughout the film itself thus we already know when the jump scares are going to happen. Most of them, you'll find them on the trailer. And don't you just hate it when that happens. In any event, uh, The Curse of La Llorona, I'm glad that now we have Latino-centric folklore in horror cinema. Not just on the indie field, but on Hollywood in the big playing field. Now we can showcase some Latino culture here. The fact of the matter is, how will it be portrayed? I, I see we have a Latino cast, a cast of uh, um, those, what you would normally expect in supernatural, Latino supernatural themes. Santeria looks like there's some Santeria going on there. I'm not quite sure what type of occult is being played here on the storyline. Let's see and find out. I think a lot of fans, especially uh, non-casual -ca viewers of horror, are expecting a horror treat. Uh, I once again reiterate, that's not going to be the case here. We're going to find a psychological horror, horror thriller, less scares, jump scares, sure, just to keep you at the edge of your seat, but more story-driven. And that's a, a lot of James Wan's films is like that, are like that. 
Uh, La Llorona, I know for a fact we are going to see a sequel and or trilogy for this particular entity, for this particular film. Uh, what are the circumstances for these characters? How well would they... What are the circumstances at the final act? I am not sure, but I am 100% confident we are going to see either a sequel or trilogy. La Llorona, it's been embedded in Latino culture for eons, from millennial, from South America to Puerto Rico. There's different variations of this tale but all center on the same thing. It also parallels El Ciplón, the Whistler, same thing, this entity that kidnaps children. Yeah, I have my hopes up for this. I know what to expect based on the trailer. I think the acting looks superb. I think the the special effects, especially with the uh, those hands grabbing the girls here in the bathroom, while she's taking a bath that's creepy as fuck and you can see that there's practical effects and cgi layered over those practical effects that's what i like using cgi to touch up on practical effects and not a hundred percent cgi creature we may see that i could be wrong if that's the case i'm in for a huge letdown yeah i'm looking forward to it so far as rated R, that's good. Not PG-13, as usually is the custom with horror films these days. Hell of a night. Where did you get a Ouija board? Doesn't matter. Okay, so you know how to play, right? Don't we need, like, candles or something for this to work? Ouija. Ouija. Are you a ghost? Guess that's a no. The second trailer, first impressions, is the second trailer for this segment is Hell of a Night, a one hour, 24 minute horror thriller released. According to INDB, the 22nd of January, 2019, the film is written and directed by Brian Childs with the synopsis that reads as follows. After moving to a new town, a young college student retreats to the country for a weekend of solace when she quickly finds out that she is not alone and needs to fight for her life. The film is now available on Amazon Prime. Based on the trailer, the opening few seconds, I said to myself, oh boy, here we go. Another movie of uh, curious teenagers delving into the supernatural by playing with the Ouija board. We all know how this is going to play out. But as the trailer developed, it went a different course. Uh, the cinematography is fantastic. There was a sense of suspense, a build of thrillers aspect to it. We have close angles. We have the low camera angles. We see the swing uh, moving in the foreground and the, unsuspe the unsuspecting person in the background. That's clever. And of course, we see the shower scene, the girl taking a shower in the overhead uh, camera view, which gives the impression of, yeah, there is a bigger presence in that room sharing a shower with you. Nevertheless, I am intrigued of this trailer. Uh, it, the acting was good. I don't, I did not find any be movie like quality in the dialogue and or portrayal of any of the characters the color as well with the two girls sitting in the car a fantastic color painting which really sets the mood and tension in that particular scene 
they have in the trailer you do not see the antagonizing force which is this old lady supposedly haunting this home which is good because i want to be surprised i want to know it, while watching the film what does this creature look like if it's cgi or if it's practical effects many often many times are not the trailers are cut in such a way that you get a glimpse of the creature and yeah that could either make or break the viewership of watching the film i'm curious to see this hell of a night it looks good looks interesting yeah you have the typical cliche elements you have the cabin in the woods you have the the solitude of the person living there uh, you have the ouija board tossed in as well yes of course these are pretty much trademarks in these type of films i don't think it breaks the film in any type of way i would have to see the film in its entirety to get the gist of what everything is about to come up with a solid uh opinion on the product on this project i enjoyed the trailer uh yeah i don't find anything any cons whatsoever with the footage provided soul harvest the harvesting original title You guys are going to love the country. Open fields, fresh air. This is it. Great, no signal. That's the whole point, bud. Get away from it all. Can we go play, Mom? Sure. But don't go too far. Can you feel that? Next is the trailer first impressions for Soul Harvest. The original title for this film, according to INDB, is The Harvesting. The synopsis. To escape their marital problems, a young family travels from the city to spend the summer in Amish County, where a malevolent presence grips them. They soon discover that they were brought there for a reason and they must break free before the demonic hold consumes them. This film is directed by Ivan Kravjevic and written by Ben Everhart. Based on the synopsis, I was about to say, okay, here we go. Isolated cabin, family, unsuspecting family, haunted house, typical play by play. But that wasn't the case. From the start, we see the cliche gets removed. No cell phone service. But there's a legitimate reason. Hello, we're in the country. That really does happen. Uh, take it from me, I've been in uh, not even the country, but even the, the suburb of New York and there is no cell phone service. But it was a clever play and to eliminate that cliche. You have the family, unsuspecting family, visiting a country home. But of, well here, once again, the cliches are removed. There is a level of suspense and psychological thriller uh, brewing within the plot, especially when the young girl looks out the window and she sees an apparition. When the mother arrives, there is nothing there. I appreciate those type of buildups, as opposed to, say, for example, the mother were to approach the window and you would have a cheap jump scare to entice audiences we don't need that sometimes you you do yeah depending on what you want to do but oftentimes it's not needed it's just overly done those jump scares in any event we have to the first of my knowledge aside from children of the corn a supernatural presence revolving around an amish community we hardly see that that is commendable breaking the mold using something different thinking outside the box that's all we want here in independent horror or mainstream horror from hollywood just take something that is has been done regurgitated change it around and here we have a 
country backdrop set in an Amish county. Hey, that works for me. The question here is, will how how does the whole plot translate throughout the whole film? We would have to review the film, sit, watch it again, uh, watch it a couple of times to get the full feel, just emotional content, etc., etc. of the film. Based on the trailer, the acting seems solid. I'm really interested in what is going on with this family what is this supernatural presence why is this family in particular being sacrificed or alluding to some type of sacrifice uh what else hmm cgi i think uh, there is hardly any cgi content which is good uh with the exception for that scene which draws emotional impact that person getting run over by a truck that 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 right there is good editing whoever cut this trailer was very careful to add that towards the end to entice viewership yeah i'm interested in soul harvest the harvesting original title according to indb it's readily available now if you head on over to vimeo they have the trailer, which we will also be providing. Uh, they have a rent or buy option for this film. Beasts of the Field. I would like to hire you now for a paying gig. So, this is a new show. It's a pilot. I will, of course, be presenting it. So y'all looking for some kind of creature, ain't you? Some kind of monster. Why don't we stop? I thought I saw something. Closing out our final segment, Trailer First Impressions, is the film Beasts of the Field. Here's the synopsis. A delusional cryptozoologist and a psychopathic television presenter lead an amateur expedition into wild forests in the hope of finding the legendary Thunderbird, which they believe is the ancestor of a prehistoric Patheradon. The film is directed by Chase Dudley and written by Gregory Blair with Brent Slab Chuck. The film, wow, I am the trailer, that is, I am at a loss of words. I know there is a market for B-movie stylized horror films. If there weren't, filmmakers would not be creating this artistic form. Some may enjoy these pieces, most may not. The acting portrayed in this film from it it's evident in the trailer. You can't there's no ifs, ands, or buts around it. It's typical B movie acting. There is a lack of emotion, no content or context in the lines delivered. Furthermore, the sound quality, I'm unsure if it's the trailer itself, and I hope that's not the case with the full feature film, but it's so it's it's terrible. It's terrible. I listened to the trailer with headphones, without headphones, through my near field monitors, and it still sounds there's something wrong with it. Quite not quite sure what it is, but uh, yeah, they should fix that, and hopefully we will not see that in the in the final product. The cinematography is whoa. Okay. I hate to use the word amateurish, but they could have been a certain level of quality with the cinematography, the color, the camera angles. As I stated, there is a market for, there's an audience that do appreciate B-movie quality horror films. I, for one, I trek, I'm borderline. It, if the plot is good enough, I would overlook certain things such as the acting or special effects. But if you don't have a storyline to hold, to glue together every other component that may not fit, then your presentation does fall apart. I would have to see the whole film to get the whole vibe of what's going on here. 
but so far i know what to expect this is really b-movie quality acting b-movie quality graphics and b-movie quality cinematography <laughs>